if we follow this interpretation, then one could argue that what we're looking at here uh, is indeed a migration history created by an ancestral northern Tiwa artist who saw individual places as subsumed within this linear progression. And this would certainly seem to complicate the place-based philosophy we've been considering. In fact, there are other Pueblo statements in which both historical and place-based strategies of reckoning identity are simultaneously expressed and in which history seems to be presented as primary. When Tessie Naranjo writes uh, that in the, in the Tewa tradition, for instance, specific geographic boundaries are not the important elements because as the people moved, their mountain boundaries also moved. The idea was to have boundaries to create a place, to fix a place temporarily within a larger idea of movement. When she writes this, we might imagine uh, that what we're seeing here is something uh, a little bit closer to the Euro-American notion of progress. Here, historical movement through the landscape is privileged as the larger idea, and placemaking seems to be presented as secondary and contingent. Minimally, at least, I think we can acknowledge uh, that there's an ongoing tension, or at least a dialogue, between history and place going on. Now, as I've grappled with this question of how a group of people can both claim to be constituted by a place and claim to be constituted by their movement across a landscape through a historical succession of places, I found it useful in my own writing uh, to draw upon the car radio uh, as a metaphor. Not those new uh, fancy satellite radios. Um, that's not what I'm talking about uh, here. Uh, I'm talking about that kind of old timey uh, radio with the knobs uh, that you turn uh, as you struggle uh, to try and uh, tune into local radio broadcasts, the kind of radio that never worked very well in you know, northern New Mexico mountainous terrain. Now, the car radio uh, actually provides a useful object lesson, uh, I think, insofar as, like Pueblo identities, we can describe it in two different but equally valid ways at the same time. On one hand, the transistor radio as a physical object undertakes a clear trajectory through space, made in Japan, probably, uh, and then emerging on the scene in American consumer society, it becomes a kind of thing in movement, uh, in motion, and it's defined by its ability to do precisely this, to move from place to place. On the other hand, it's clearly the case that in practice, we rarely pay attention to the radio as a physical object uh, that originated elsewhere. We don't engage with it as a Japanese radio, in other words. Rather, the radio in our daily engagements is defined firstly by the songs and voices that come out of it. And these songs and voices are indeed tethered in the sense of being entirely local to the proximate region surrounding a broadcasting tower. The radio's wires and buttons and knobs and all of that, these may be from somewhere else, but the radio's sound, its behavior, is always completely indigenous wherever it goes. The songs uh, of the transistor radio emerge from the features of the landscape itself. This is why the broadcasting industry now refers to it as terrestrial radio. Unlike satellite radio, uh, which has the same playlist wherever you go, Terrestrial car radios take on a distinctive Hispanic identity in Albuquerque, uh, an evangelical identity in Oklahoma City, uh, and a New Age identity in Sedona. I could go on. <laughs> Here, then, is a metaphor, perhaps, for thinking about how a native philosophy might conceptualize people whose ancestors were always from somewhere else uh, in the historical sense but who are also simultaneously from the immediate landscape and nowhere else from the place, in the place-based sense. We might even push this metaphor further and think about indigenization as a process of tuning in to the local signals of a place. In fact, this is precisely the way Deloria wrote about Native American religions as systems by which groups adjusted themselves and their lives to the mountains and springs and rivers that surrounded them. And this sort of tuning in, Deloria further argued, must also be understood as a distinctively Native American form of revelation. In the Christian tradition, of course, God reveals himself in history. He provides uh, the faithful with universally true knowledge about the world that can then be carried to new places. 
Christianity in this sense is like satellite radio with a globally revealed message beamed down from on high that, sends, uh, that sounds the same, or at least is supposed to sound the same, uh, no matter where one goes. Revelation in Native American traditions, Deloria suggests, has always been a contingent and aggressively provincial affair. Revelation was seen as a continuous process of adjustment to the natural surroundings and not as a specific message valid in all times and places, he writes. If Christianity and the Western intellectual tradition more generally is like satellite radio, then Native American traditions are like terrestrial radio, I think. And Native American epistemologies, we might conclude, are like the process of adjusting the knobs in search of a strong local signal from the nearest broadcasting tower. This process of revelation, of tuning in, is pl plenty evident, I think, in Pueblo ethnography. But we can also see it in certain archaeological contexts uh, as well. I recently did some preliminary research at a site that I'd argue uh, was very much engaged in just this sort of landscape revelation. The El Bosque uh, site is located a short distance south of Taos uh, on the outskirts of the contemporary community of Dixon. It's an ancestral northern Tiwa settlement, which is to say that it, broadly speaking, is part of the ancestry of Taos and Picaris Pueblos. As best as we can tell, the site uh, is composed of perhaps 200 multi-story rooms poised on the edge of a high terrace overlooking the Embudo River to the south, all constructed and occupied uh, by uh, what seems to be quite a brief period during the 13th century. And thus far, all of our uh, research suggests that it was built by recent arrivals. Uh, at least the site's ceramics, its architecture, even its economic commitments, uh, these all uh, appear to us as breaks with um, respect to the uh, prior occupation of the region. Now we can discuss a site like El Bosque as a village of first generation immigrants uh, or non-locals, occupiers of a foreign land, residents at one brief stop in a long migratory sequence of places um, that originated elsewhere. But I doubt very much that the village community saw itself in these bluntly historical terms. At least there are hints that a place-based strategy of tuning into the landscape uh, was a dominant concern at the site. Like modern Taos Pueblo, uh, El Bosque is centered uh, on a major waterway, in this case, uh, the largest arroyo uh, in the area. Um, this waterway divides the site in two. Uh, it effectively uh, constitutes a dual social division within this community. And if we project a Taos-like ceremonial moiety system back onto the ancestral past, then we might imagine uh, El Bosque's residents conceiving of their very social organization as a profoundly local pattern as well, as a pattern that emerged, as it were, out of the immediate landscape uh, and the community's engagement with it. El Bosque's residents also centered their village by encircling it with shrines that mapped onto natural features. Large rocks like this one around the village were subtly transformed into shrines by being accented with cupules and grinding slicks, grinding slicks that mimic, interestingly, the abrasions of water-worn rocks uh, in the local arroyos. Two to five kilometers away from the village in each of the cardinal directions, larger shrines were constructed on prominent mesas or mountaintops. These shrines assume uh, a variety of uh, forms. Here you are looking at an image of a rock circle shrine on a peak to the east of the El Bosque site. Uh, two of my students are involved in mapping this site. All of these shrines are uh, directly oriented towards El Bosque. They focus their attention towards the home village. Alfonso Ortiz famously wrote of such mountaintop shrines as a kind of ceremonial technology designed to gather together the world's blessings and broadcast them back to a home community as a key means by which a village came to materially exist at the center of a cosmos. And El Bosque was consciously positioning itself to receive transmissions in just this way, I think. In fact, it can hardly be a coincidence uh, that the village was perched on one of the very few places within the Embudo Valley uh, where you can just see Mount Sicomo peaking up um, on the horizon, 50 kilometers or so to the southwest. Again, 
revolution uh, was seen as a continuous process of adjustment to the natural surroundings. This is uh, Deloria's basic observation about Native American religions uh, generally. And we can assume, I think, that the community at El Bosque participated uh, in these sorts of practices. My guess then is that El Bosque's residents would have claimed, as their descendants at Taos Pueblo claim today, that they emerged right there, out of the local landscape, even as they simultaneously told stories about their ancestral migrations across a distant and horizontal landscape. Okay, I've saved uh, for the very end of my talk a second case study, uh, a second place as it were, uh, and one that really deserves to be considered side by side with the Pueblo example. The landscape, broadly speaking, is the same. Indeed, the site I want to briefly turn to is located only about 20 kilometers north of El Bosque, and it too was occupied by relatively recent immigrants, or at least by families whose ancestors had traveled to the region only a few generations back. These were Hispanic immigrants, and their small community was a Catholic one, residing in what uh, was then Cieneguilla, uh, and today is uh, the small village of Pilar, just off Highway 68 uh, on the road up to Taos. The image uh, that you're looking at here is actually from a 1950s postcard. Uh, and it probably would have looked quite similar to this uh, in the uh, 19th century. Indeed, this was a time in the 19th century during which Pilar uh, was probably home to uh, a dozen or so families, most of whom probably descended from the early Spanish colonists. The local oral histories mention a degree of intermarriage, uh, both with the Hickoria and Ute tribes. A certain number of residents were probably detribalized Native Americans, or Janiceros as well. It was certainly then an ethnically complex place. Now, I became interested in the history of this community back in 2007 when I stumbled upon this structure uh, while doing archaeological survey nearby. These are the crumbling ruins of a Murata, or a meeting house, used by the Penitente Brotherhood um, during uh, the 19th century. The Penitentes emerged uh, as a formal fraternal organization, as many of you know, of course, during the early 19th century in response to a precipitous decline in the clergy available to serve the now quite isolated New Mexican communities, particularly following Mexican independence in 1821. Into this void, the Penitentes assumed spiritual leadership and developed local systems of mutual aid. And the brothers typically built uh, these small and windowless maradas at the edges of villages to serve as meeting houses, as chapels, and focal points uh, for holy week rituals that publicly dramatized the passion. In the 19th century, uh, these were key public ceremonial events, bringing the Catholic community together. Now, I've already discussed Deloria's critique of the broader Christian traditions privileging of history and its willingness to override the specificities of place. And at first glance, it surely seems that the Romanos or, or Penitente brothers uh, in Pilar followed in step. In the landscape surrounding their Murata, for instance, they packed hundreds of cross icons, which could easily be interpreted as yet another uh, uh, example of satellite radio, as it were, uh, another example of the imposition of an old world history onto new world places. Indeed, this imposition might be regarded as all the more striking insofar as the Penitentes theatrically reenacted Near Eastern history, uh, the Near Eastern history of Christ's passion nearby. This is the Murata's Calvario, uh, where Lenten rituals were undertaken uh, each year, where the initiated submitted uh, to bodily trials, um, uh, enduring pain to atone for the community's sins and achieve greater intimacy with the divine. There were plenty of serviceable locations in the vicinity for these ritual trials, but the Romanos in Pilar chose to stage the crucifixion directly atop a 13th century kiva, directly above, that is, the subterranean remains of an indigenous ceremonial chamber. The Calvario was actually uh, inserted into the kiva fill. Sherds and other artifactual traces of the small Pueblo habitation uh, are scattered about, and devout onlookers would have stood on the low mounded ruins uh, of the Pueblo room block uh, that once accompanied the kiva. Christ's death, then, seems to have been intentionally reenacted each year uh, in the middle of a palpably pagan space. And this is a remarkable juxtaposition uh, that was surely a conscious choice. In fact, the entire Penitente landscape in the hills above Pilar overlays a complex distribution of Native American sites extending back thousands of years. 
And this raises the question of how the local Catholic community in the 19th century grappled with the decidedly non-Catholic specificities of this particular place. For the past few years, I've been investigating this question in collaboration uh, with my colleague and good friend, Daryl Wilkinson, who's uh, with us tonight. Uh, and what we've discovered is that the local Catholic community, rather than bluntly imposing itself on the native landscape, appears to have been mapping onto and working closely in dialogue with the pre-colonial native traces. So that superposition might not have been a, an act of disrespect at all, but rather an act of profound respect, we're now thinking. Hundreds of archaic and Pueblo icons at the site remain intact, with crosses simply pecked a respectful distance away. In some cases, Native American glyphs are actually incorporated into the Catholic rock art panels in what appears to be a syncretic mixture of traditions. In this image, for instance, you're looking at a cross and a Pueblo-style serpent, both pecked in the same hand. And here is my favorite example of iconographic mixing at the site. Here we see a dominant uh, glyph of four concentric circles. This is a common Pueblo glyph. Uh, it's frequently interpreted as referencing Puebloan notions of center place uh, and perhaps even the four worlds uh, through which the ancestral Pueblo people are said to have traveled. But here, as you can see, a cross has been added, extending off of the top uh, of those circles, effectively transforming this Pueblo cosmogram into a Globus Crucigur icon. For example, uh, for comparison rather, I offer you this 15th century uh, illustration uh, of the Globus Crucigur icon here held in uh, the Christ child's hand. This icon, uh, the Christian icon, is typically interpreted as a symbol of the universality of Christianity, of the global significance and reach of Christ's sacrifice. In this sense, there is indeed a special irony uh, in the replacement of a Pueblo cosmogram for the Christian globe. For we seem to be presented with a situation in which both the universality and also the provincialism of New Mexican Christianity are simultaneously being acknowledged. At the Pilar Morada site, then, we are on the one hand confronted with evidence of a set of Catholic performances that were consumed with history, specifically the core events of history, the transcendent act of Christ's sacrifice, which secured salvation for the world at large. On the other hand, we encounter an assertion of place uh, that transformed this universal understanding of history into a distinctively New Mexican experience, a complexly multi-ethnic uh, experience born of colonialism and the mingling of Native American and Spanish populations and the sway of a landscape already inscribed with ancient meanings uh, that simply couldn't be ignored. Perhaps it's not surprising in this sense that for most of the 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, the penitente tradition stood outside the Catholic Church's leadership structure and was generally regarded as an illegitimate local offshoot in need of reform. Devout though the Romanos uh, were in their Catholicism and dedicated uh, though they were to pious participation in Christ's suffering, the penitente tradition was too local, too uh, distinctively New Mexican, too much of its place to be accepted by church leaders uh, in Rome initially. Okay, so where are we to take, what are we to take away from these two examples uh, and indeed from Deloria's writings more generally? I'd like to offer two uh, final concluding thoughts. First, I think we can still be good anthropologists uh, and acknowledge that there uh, is indeed a common human experience that stands behind all cultural traditions. The tension between history and place, I think, is indeed a human universal, insofar as all people somehow have to simultaneously emerge out of a history, out of a particular past, uh, as well as uh, uh, emerge out of an engagement with place, with their surroundings, uh, with the world around them. This was as true for the ancestral Pueblo communities as it was for ancestral Hispano communities in New Mexico, as it was true, of course, for the Anglo folks who began to arrive here in the 19th century. But I would question, um, what I would question is whether we need to regard religion uh, as the universal strategy by which human populations resolve this tension between history and place. This brings me to my second point. 
religion as a cross-cultural category initially arose to describe a very particular way of thinking about the world as a transcendent uh, historical narrative that unfolds uh, universally and remakes or at least attempts to remake places in the process. Religion arose to describe a set of beliefs and practices, in other words, that can move and be taken up in new lands while fundamentally remaining the same. It arose, that is, to describe what we now call world religions. And we do well to remember that it was only quite recently, uh, and indeed for strongly political rather than truly intellectual reasons, that this category of religion came to be extended to indigenous communities like the Pueblos as a means of talking about uh, their very different uh, philosophies of place. It needn't have played out that way. In fact, compelling arguments are now being made that if one is to go looking for equivalence to Native American doings within the European or Euro-American tradition, then the strongest parallels are perhaps to be found not in Western religions, but rather in Western science, particularly in the ecological sciences. After all, plant communities, rainfall patterns, and the health of animal populations, these are central to both. Of course, this is a much more radical and subversive translation uh, because whereas in a secular society, we now accept that there are many equally valid religions, we still typically think that there's supposed to be only one true authoritative and entirely universal science, namely the science of the modern West. That's another story. Here, my primary goal really has been to argue for a renewed engagement with the writings of Vine Deloria, Jr. As anthropologists, we have a great deal to learn from God is Red. Still, for to quote Vine Deloria again, when one group is concerned with the philosophical problem of space and the other with the philosophical problem of time, then the statements of each either group do not make sense uh, when transferred from one context to the other. To which I will only add in closing, amen. Thank you.